AJ Walsh in Hiroshima City, and today talking with Dr. Menku in Hiroshima, Higashi Hiroshima, at yes. uh, Hiroshima University campus. Is that right, Meng? Yes. Yeah, thank you so much for joining today. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, it's so wonderful that we actually met in person in Mitarai, which has been the focus of your research. Um, just uh, last week or two weeks ago for the Shiosai yeah. Festival, right? Right. Now, the Shiosai Festival is one of the festivals that you've been researching information about. How does that help to revitalize rural communities? Um, we'll be talking about that a little bit later. But I would love to start with a little bit about you and your background. Can you tell us how you ended up with this interest? and focus and in Hiroshima. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, everybody know me as Mo here. So it's easy for people to remember. I'm from China. Uh, back to uh, 10 years ago, I was working in Shanghai for seven years. Uh, after working in the major big city for a really long time, I'm doing uh, interactive design museum augmented reality related thing then one day i really decided to change my lifestyle a little bit so i start to get to know the university from japan and especially higashi hiroshima city is where hiroshima university located is very uh not the center city atmosphere so you can see farm and mountain outside my window so this is exactly i really want to enjoy uh living in rural japan and also uh, because the Southern Inland Sea is really close to here, just just 30 minutes driving from uh, from Higashi Hiroshima to Akitsu, you can enjoy islandscape. So so many factors yeah. push me to move from urban China to rural Japan. <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, uh, from your excellent introduction video, um, which you shared with me, uh, you talk about uh, your design, your start in um, Shanghai and then coming yeah. to Japan. And you guys have such a beautiful house. Me. I came to... Um, mm -hmm. Is that in Higashi Hiroshima? Uh, I think, yeah, uh, I made some part in my house, but I'm not sure. Some some uh, photos are from my field work during research. Yeah, this is my house. So this is uh, when you yeah. were in Shanghai and then this is your house? No, that's from my field work. But ah, this, okay, okay, uh, yeah, uh, I was thinking it's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, you were in the Taoyaka program. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Because yeah. I see that uh, Thomas Klepfer is also there. Yes, yeah, and that's correct. And he has been on this talk show a few times. He's a organic farmer, no-till mm -hmm. farmer in Hiroshima. Yeah, so uh, the story of Taoyaka back to my PhD, uh, which uh, from start from 2016 to 2021. So uh, my wife and I both graduated from this program. So it's a global leading PhD program, uh, which required us to do a, a lot of on-site education, on-site training. So I remember we also need to commit ourselves with one year lens to do a community engaged project. That's how I uh, really uh, get to know the uh, the beautiful island of Osaki, Shimojima, and the Mitala community. So therefore, I select Mitala as my onsite team project by um, conducting a series of uh, community engaged uh, volunteer activity as well as organizing an art exhibition for Mitala back to 2018. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Uh, you've you've done so much, so many interesting projects. And uh, the other day I talked with David Bila, who is mm -hmm. the Setuuchi Explorer, and he focuses a lot on the famous art islands of right. Japan in Kagawa and Okayama. And mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about that. Is that where your research started on those islands? Okay. Yeah, my main PhD research uh, for my PhD uh, uh, five years PhD program is actually the Seto Ujichinali because uh, basically 12 are islands, right? So I focus on the major six like uh, Naoshima, Teshima, Inujima, Okijima, Megijima, as well as Shodoshima. But after I researched there, I realized that's a quite big scale 
and the kind of mega scale art festival attracts a million of tourists every 100 days. Uh, especially those tourists, a lot of them are international tourists and visit depopulating Japanese rural community and, and by using those socially engaged art uh, and tourism. So I think that's quite amazing because they have a quite a complex partnership also by using the, the national funding for, for rural revitalization. I think that's great. And they have a world ranking artists like Yaoshi Kusama, Tado Ando for the architect design. So that's really fascinating for most people. But for me, Mitala has nothing. My first fieldwork interview back to 2017 in Mitala, I got a three answer. I just think Polly asked him, what, what do you have? Then they just reply three answer. One, we don't have people. Second, we don't have enough effort to promote, to attract anyone. Then three, uh, we, we, we basically don't have anything. That's the answer I got. I think if we can do something here, uh, that would be really amazing change. I mean, compared with you have a national budget support and world ranking artist support, this will be a completely more bottom up approach. Or yeah, that's, that's how that's I end up with the people on the island. That's so interesting, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. But they don't realize that they actually have a lot of appeal. Exactly. Um, Mitsurai is very special um, mm -hmm. and part of the appeal uh, usually with rural towns like this that are so well preserved one of the reasons usually is regulation they make right. some kind of rule uh, you can't build new hotels you can't build buildings which are bigger than the others mm -hmm. has Mitsurai done anything like that because it is such a beautifully preserved village right mm. Okay, for answering that, uh, first of all, uh, they, they have this organization called Julian Camp for the most historical towns. And they do have uh, uh, support for renovating and maintaining the townscape, but only kind of limited for the looking of the townscape. But they also uh, have a lot of policy to attract people who is business, uh, not just area population, but they actually uh, play a role of the change maker of that area. People like Tom, like Inoue Sam, like, uh, like Tanaga Sam, they all locate to that area and start making change. And what they do, uh, the most significant thing is they try to run away the inside of those houses. So with a top down support and a bottom up initiative, they really uh, kind of match, uh, grasp this opportunity to really doing something, not just for the looking, but also in terms of uh, a co-creation, uh, community co-creation through not just tourism, but also the old house renovation and also other creative uh, creativity aspect, like organizing art festival, uh, organizing art event, uh, writing article, introduce the island and also doing tourism. Yeah, so uh, showing your video again, this mm -hmm. uh, in your video, it's it's so beautiful. And this is something that you've developed more. You started a documentary mm -hmm. series as well with interviews. Um, did that start when your research started in 2018 or did it develop over time? Yeah, uh, back to 2018, I actually did a kind of... Uh, uh, just landscape based video with a drone like the footage from this one uh, at that time is not 4k it's just 2k uh, I think it's uh, a lot of things is not even perfect we fly the drone in a cloudy day not in a very good day but people really love it it's already beautiful enough to attract a lot of people's attention that's also one reason I want to do an exhibition for Mitali so uh, actually this motivation uh, uh, come from the island long-term resident because they mentioned they don't have anything, even the power to promote their community. So I collaborated with some uh, newcomers like Tom. We started that special exhibition. I also put this video at the entrance of uh, the museum. Uh, we, we chose the place at Hiroshima University Museum because uh, we want more young generation to engage with this 
uh, island story and uh, what you can do on the island, not just not just uh, uh, tourism. You can also come to help uh, to support the local festival, maintain the local culture. Uh, we actually, before we do this uh, exhibition, the local has a request to us. They ask us to help them to maintain their traditional festival. It's called Yagula Matsuri. So basically, uh, at at the end of July, they uh, they need a young people to carry the mikoshi is really heavy compared with the other festival experience in Japan. It's really heavy. You have to throw it away. Then you have two seconds to run away and before the mikoshi collapse. Uh, during that time, I realized two thirds of the participants are not local people. They just they just a temporary volunteer from the nearby community. Now, actually, I did a survey after that uh, that festival. I found out uh, two thirds of people either come from the nearby island or they come from uh, Kule City to come to help. So, the local festival uh, co-created by non-locals, but also their neighbors and friends, relatives, everybody who can come to help. So that's really a touching moment because uh, you see a uh, uh, Japanese government try to promote a relational population, right? So at that moment, I feel the power of relational population. So that's, uh, that basically motivated me to start to do further research for this area. So I understand we need a more relational population. So therefore, Hiroshima University has a tons of this kind of a young generation who never really visit the island, even Japanese students. Then, uh, uh, because I invite the local elderly people, uh, some are from Julian Ken, uh, some are from the, the Jijikai, the self uh, resident association, then they quite shocked by seeing so many young people in the campus. They just told me, in my village, in Mitsala, every day we can only see two or three middle-aged person. We consider them young. So, after the seeing hundred and thousand young people here, uh, we had a kind of idea. We should create an exhibition here to attract people go to Mitalai. Yeah. So uh, the exhibition, yeah, started from 2019. I actually also bring some students there. They also become the second generation of uh, relational population connect with the town, doing their research, also helping the community. Yeah. Nice. That's great. Mm -hmm. It's it's so important, and this this is something that comes up again and again uh, in this talk show series with so many people from different areas around Japan mm -hmm. making those collaborations with local universities, uh, mm -hmm. local researchers, trying to bring together lots mm. of stakeholders so you're bringing the local people on board by being there by right. trying things by bringing other people but you're mm -hmm. also collaborating with other people who might be interested in right. doing something there right and then maybe they'll start bringing people maybe they'll go back again and again but that constant reconnecting and collaborating is such mm -hmm. an important part of rural revitalization, don't you yes. think? Yeah, I totally agree with that. Uh, so I can show you some of the basic information. We had a survey from both community side and the university side, because you want to have a big picture to look at the A side and B side. Uh, are there something in common or there is a potential conflict? We need to be aware of this. Just simply bring people to there would not really help to build any resilient and and therefore you can't really say it's sustainable, right? So the the first survey we done from the festival side, a lot of them are represent the community. Also interview with a local long term person. So in general, they want young people, of course. Uh, they don't really have a bias between Japanese and foreigners. They see if, if it's a nice person, we don't really care where they come from. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yes, this one. And another, another side, what young people really interest about Mitala is they don't really want to, uh, not most of them want to immigrate to the rural Japan, but they are interested to, to help maintain the local festival scape. So this, this is very interesting. They want to become relational population, but local community, 
uh, especially long-term residents, they don't really like to receive their what they call non-stable population. They still want to uh, uh, the old good days, like go back to to the past. But the reality is very unlikely to <laughs> satisfy them. So therefore, this is a constant conversation among people. People's uh, mentalities keep changing uh, by time. Yeah. So that's one interesting I observe by comparing the both sides. That, that happens a lot, right, mm -hmm. in rural areas. Uh, just because your population is declining mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean that you want new people to come in and change everything really fast, right? Yeah. You yeah. still want to enjoy your life. You still want to live your life the way you have been living without mm -hmm. too much radical change. Yeah. Um, sometimes, and I think I mentioned this when we met at the Shiosai, Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes even to an extreme when mm -hmm. new newcomers are told, yeah. I would rather this town die completely right. than change. Like mm -hmm. some people feel that strongly and you're mm -hmm. not going to convince everyone, right? Mm -hmm. But if you can convince a few key people mm -hmm. and slowly make changes which they agree to those key yeah. people that might yeah. be the strategy right yeah so uh i'm i'm researched several islands not just uh just metalli so i i also see examples even in kagawa prefecture like the differences between megijima and ogijima so basically a good comparison to say what's what one is really active positive um, positive change a positive change, but another one is basically they work really hard to finish the art festival, but nothing happened. Uh, so it's a, it's it's uh, some Japanese uh, scholars say this is a we have to consider the local factor uh, of their culture, cultural openness. That's what their original quote. But during the research, I I somehow uh, find the more factor not just about their original culture, it's also about who are the leadership. And also the key person who play actually the the role to bring people there. So, yeah, I see if the island can re receive this kind of a change maker, I, I call them. They are quite creative class, right? They they see the problem local can never perceive their whole life. Uh, the, if a community is lucky enough to have this kind of person, they are quite lucky to have more likely have a more sustainable future compared with the, the community do not uh, receive this kind of person. But of course, each community have to work really hard to to receive this kind of person. But this is about the the factor. But beyond the factor, there is a, a different strategy. How do you really uh, make a creative place making and in a not harmful way? But there, this also connect to to a theory called creative enhancement and also the creative destruction. It's both happening. So it's not right or wrong it's just based on what kind of strategy you have so creative enhancement is more emphasized on if you create a place uh it's more diversified and also allowed more people to enjoy or the creative destruction is more related to uh maybe for example tourism development we don't use the word revitalization here we talk about development this development only create a very uh, mono landscape, very single landscape, but uh, there is only few people like a tourist can enjoy it. Local people will not never go to these kind of shops. So I think this these two factors is very important when we talk about sustainability and revitalization. Sorry, I'm just showing uh, one of the pages from Hiroshima University uh, right. showing your your research on aging mm -hmm. populations and your work in small island mm -hmm. uh, areas mm -hmm. like Mitarai. Right. Yeah, right. wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, now, you have so many wonderful insights and takeaways um, from all of your research and collaboration with local people. Um, in the art islands, uh, like you said before, but also in the Mitarai area. Let's talk about a few of the interviews that you did okay. in Mitarai with local people. 
Um, so you talked with a woman mm -hmm. who goes out early morning every day yep. and puts fresh flowers right. out and sees the sunrise. And you joined her at 4 a.m., was well, it? Well, we wake up at 4.50 and get ready ourselves at 5.20 and meet her at 5.30. So it's just the time before the sun actually come up. So it's everything in the dark. At the yeah, this lady is uh, Kakitani san and she is very willing to help our interviews, uh, documentary series. And a lot of local actually into do uh, recommend her for this topic. Uh, we choose this topic because uh, the uh, Jilin Zashi flower arrangement culture is quite unique for Mitalai, and it's not just uh uh attract tourists uh even foreigner like me uh we are really like this kind of thing because uh every day is different it's hard to imagine how much effort those people really spend uh for them so in the morning my experience is like 5 30. what is going on here it's so dark and there's no light on the street suddenly this this lady come out with a flashlight and with her uh custom made this chart with a full of flowers and also it's not just about flowers she has so many tools all those tools serve a different purpose she has a two water kettle uh, water pot one is a normal temperature water another one is a warm water based on the location of the flower if you put too cold water the flower will die in the afternoon so it's really uh, resourcefulness and uh, very knowledgeable Thing. It's like a mobile museum, and she is keep telling us a lot of knowledge about what she do is really blow our mind because normally people only appreciate the outcome. Nobody knows how this uh, flower be made and, uh, and who made it or what's the story behind. Uh, actually, after interview her, we understand all the flower are actually they grow from the seeds in four locations of Mitale. And they just not they, they are not only uh, taking care of the flower arrangement in the early morning. Actually, every day in the afternoon, they or in the uh, after they arrange the flower, they actually need to go to take care of the garden and do the fertilizer. To also change the pH of the soil, make sure uh, the flower will not have a problem to grow up near the seaside. And yeah, it's completely crazy work with only like a seven eight people doing this. And uh, they started this uh, initiative back to 20, 30 years ago, I think 20 years ago. Uh, at the beginning, they have a 60 sites in the, in the town. Uh, one more reason, they want to put flower in front of the door because they want, you know, a lot of, a lot of house is empty. It's IKEA now. Uh, but they, if they put some flower uh, at the front door or window, it looks like still people living here. So that's one, yeah. yeah. I, I like that. I actually like that idea better than the scarecrows. Yeah. But the scarecrows is another tactic, oh, yeah. right? If you have a lot of empty houses. Yeah. Uh, we have a town, Yuki Onsen town mm -hmm. in Hiroshima. Mm. And there's another famous town in Shikoku that, that makes these life-size yes. mannequins liven up the town, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. But mm. this idea of just putting out fresh flowers every day, mm. such a big effort. Yes. Um, and of course, in your video, mm. She's talking about uh, she's getting older yes. and it's difficult to keep going. Uh, if she needs to go to the hospital, it's a two hour bus ride away. Yes. So there's there's a lot of concerns about is that kind of initiative? It's working. It cheers people up. It makes people happy to go there. Yeah. But is it is it going to be possible to continue? Is it sustainable, right? Right. Yeah, that's actually the point why I think I have some call inside of my heart. I need to document this, at least show to other people, not just posting photos. I had fun in this town, but I will never come back in future. No, uh, actually, I want to show not just the people from public. I want to show my student in my class and let them know there is something going on. And those people, the youngest member, probably almost 60. So imagine 10 or 20 years later, nobody can continue to doing it anymore. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I'm just showing yeah. your uh, documentary film yeah. about uh, island revitalization yeah. focused on Mitarai uh, mm. while we're talking about right. 
this issue. So that's uh, uh, that video basically show you the background at the beginning, like the depopulation and some island losing 50 to 100 people every year. Even this newcomer, the, I can feel the sense of uncertainty about uh, what's going to happen five years later, 10 years later. But they're still optimistic. They say, we just do two and three years and uh, let's check what happened next. Yeah. So uh, not just Metala, this is a really a, a entire Japan kind of issue. When we go to go to some community in Kyushu, they just mentioned we are the only family in this mountain valley. So imagine 10 years later, our kids will be the only kids in this mountain. And what are we going to do during that time? So I went in. This is the, one of the yeah. um, parts coming up right here. Mm -hmm. Uh, talking about the area was so famous for many, yes. many years, maybe hundreds of years for citrus farming. Right. And he says in the video, we used to have 6,500 citrus farmers. Yeah. Now we have 1,500. Yes. And then one of the local people saying we used to have 100 people mm -hmm. in the town. Now we have 50, mm -hmm. right? Like it, the problems with the lack of farmers, mm -hmm. the lack of residents right. is happening very quickly, mm. especially in these island communities, right? Yeah. yeah, actually, since we talk about citrus farm on the island, uh, I think uh, within those years, uh, one of our students become a, a citrus farmer. That's something really, really make me really proud because most of the students, they graduate from this university, they go to Tokyo, Osaka or go to other country, or they will never go back to rural area. But recently we see the change. There is a possibility to also uh, allow students to become a potential organic farmer or, or local business and stay in this kind of places. Yeah. Mm. Um, I think that's a, that's a great initiative. And he was also at the Shio side yeah. uh, in the same area. You were showing yeah. your documentary. Yeah. And uh, Yoko-san, who you just saw, and mm. Tom-san, yeah. they are also very influential. Yep. This place we're seeing right now is Yoko's place mm -hmm. um, that she mm. has taken on and remodeled. This is the farmer yes. from your university, yes, right? Yes, that's Tsubasa. <clears throat> so it's, it's wonderful to see. And of course, this Saturday, mm -hmm. Uh, we are collaborating with Yoko and using her yes. place for the women's event. Yeah. Uh, so having that kind of venue, mm. which can bring people in yeah. um, for education, for workshops, for events like Shiosai, yeah. is also really important to have that as an asset. Yes. Exactly. Um, this man here, he has a great story. Yes. I'll go back to him. Yeah, Tanagaso. He... He helps to open up all the houses during Shiosai, yeah. right? He is a, the, the leader, uh, actually, the founder of Shiosai. They have a four core member for Shiosai Art Festival. Yeah, Tanaka-san is the person moved to the island back to 2017. I also meet him when he just opened his gallery. Then we, we, we had a really uh, nice conversation. After that, we also, with Tom, we co-create the... the exhibition back to the university so actually he also brings some of his painting to johnny uh so give a full looking of island nature culture history as well as art yeah so that yeah. was that was the theme of your exhibition yeah. right nature history culture art yes so and uh yeah. He 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 talked about. I think you told me this. Mm. Uh, he goes around and gets all the keys, yeah. so that he can open up a lot of places, even if they're not usually open. Yeah. And then for the event, they use these buildings mm. so that people have a sense of uh, being able to go in buildings you usually can't go in, right? Yeah, that's the point. He he actually not just an artist, he did a lot of amazing landscape painting, uh, but he spent more time to actually uh, make a good relationship with local, like that renovation uh, shins, yeah, then turn it to the art side. She, he he carried the whole uh, town's key for Akia for the uh, weekend houses because the local trust him. I, I never see any newcomer has this kind of power 
to really convince all the local elderly people to to open up this house. As it, he also mentioned, after he opened those places, he just not open an empty house. He opened a memory box for local elderly people. So oh, during the that's lovely. yeah during the renovation, local people will tell him what happened in this place ten years and twenty years ago, and their parents yeah. or their grandparents' memory here. And he will kind of uh, uh, re uh, reuse this place by considering this story and also tell the artists. So some of the artists they not just borrow this place; they actually engage with this place. So this is a really good co-creation process. It's not like a, a, the yellow pumpkin from Naoshima; they just borrow it from from the museum and put it there. But there is no connection. Uh, th this is the real side Pacific art. It's not just about the artwork hanging on the wall. It's a, it's about the entire eventness, the story behind the invisible thing, uh, behind this site. So that's that's quite, uh, uh, that's uh, quite amazing, in my opinion. So therefore, I I think that's amazing too, mm. and I think that I just came from the Minka Summit mm. last month. And uh, so many people enthusiastic about having these old buildings, which have so much value mm -hmm. because of their heritage and their connection to culture and history. Mm -hmm. They prefer having these buildings to new buildings, right? And so it's so nice to see not only foreigners who are seeking these out, right. but also local Japanese people who realize these buildings tell stories. Mm. These buildings have memories. Yeah. And the connection to the past is part of the appeal, yeah. right? So during the, the show site, show site actually has another role. It's not just art event and like everywhere else did, like I said, okay. But show site really allow people to stay in Mitalai much longer. Before they just walk around the town, uh, consume a cup of coffee or buy a scone from town. But now they actually spend more time to walk into these places to see the beauty as well as see art. Yeah. And also one important update after the show set from last finished from last week, uh, Tanaka-san told me this year, more people come to Mitale. It's not just about Mitale. They come here to see Shosa and art. So I'm really happy to to hear these changes. Oh, that's wonderful mm. to hear. Uh, we have a comment from Facebook. Right. Thank you, Tiffany. She says, thanks for sharing the these inspiring stories. The more I watch doc document <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Documentaries about rural areas. Here, I'll put it here so you can read it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> rural areas in Japan, the more I love this country. Mm. How nice. I just came back from Yama, Yame yeah. City in Kyushu, mm -hmm. helping local farmers and learn so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's true, right? Uh, the more you spend time in these areas, mm -hmm. uh, the more you hear the local stories the more you can appreciate it's not yeah it's not just and me today has a famous lighthouse that everybody goes to see yeah. right mm. but it's not just about that one site mm. it's not just about going there and taking your photo and leaving mm -hmm. the real appeal of these small places right are when you stay and when you talk to locals and when you learn about the lady that wakes up at 5 a.m. to do all the flowers every day yeah. or the shiosai where they open up all the buildings and do artwork uh, to bring people in. Mm -hmm. All of these stories have so much appeal yeah. for the visitor as well as really reinforce the sense of pride for local people in living there, right? Yeah, in terms of a sustainable development, especially for tourism, I really highlight the, uh, the role of creative tourism because the center uh, theoretical focus of creative tourism is uh, co-creation as well as learning experiences. People just go there, not just passively visiting a place. They interact with the people. They not just only interact, they also help to co-create with the local resident and 
business stakeholders. So this is a co-creation process. It's very likely to happen in small scale. That we don't bring many people. Uh, for example, back to 2018, we interviewed uh, a lot of uh, uh, business, business stakeholders in Mitsala. Uh, you know, just 10, 10 or 15 businesses is not a really big scale. But a lot of them mentioned, we need the people to stay longer, spend more, rather than having more number come here. Yeah, that's very important. They want to... Uh, they, they don't just want the people, they want the people to really uh, generate economy value. It's not just about mm, there is a place you can, you can have fun with. Sustain their future as well for this uh, tourism engaged business. So creative tourism is one way you have more. Uh, I don't know if you observe during the Shosa Art Festival this year, they have uh, more than uh, three and four art workshops. Yeah, this is a 2019, but this year they have more events. So really allow you to not just see art, you really actually making the art by yourself. Yeah, we, we tried several art workshops. Uh, it's basically, it's allow tourists to stay longer and pay more. This is a very smart strategies. I think the, yeah. the, the local uh, <clears throat> tourism business network is really, uh, I see this kind of a transformation on site. So I, yeah. I, I wish one of, one of the uh, sustainable tourism mm. things that I, I appreciated that I, I noticed the first time I visited mm. um, was that th when you come over to me today, most people have to come by car. Right. And when they come over the bridge, they have to pay a toll. Mm -hmm. And when you come over, if you buy anything above 1000 yen yeah. from one of the local shops, then you can get a coupon from the tourist office mm -hmm. to get a free toll going back. Right. And it, this seems really small, mm -hmm. but in terms of leaving money in the local community, this yeah. is really smart. Yeah. Because a lot of people might just come, take a picture of the famous lantern uh, or uh, lighthouse, and then go home without spending any money. Mm. So there aren't a lot of businesses but there are enough businesses that you can spend money at mm -hmm. to have a, a coffee or a scone at Tom's place or uh, buy some honey mm -hmm. from the local shop or jam, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that really helps support local businesses. And I thought that was really smart. Yeah. I haven't seen that yeah. in yeah. other many other yeah. rural areas cool. in Japan. Mm. Yeah, It's like you allow people to pay some tax for you. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, but it's it's also a way to improve their visit, mm. right? right? Because if if a visitor comes and this happens in Hawaii all the time, yeah. uh, you have big buses going around the island and people just stop and take a photo of the famous mm. thing right. and then get back on the bus and they don't buy anything. Yeah. Alex Kerr found the same thing mm. when people were visiting the Ia Valley. Right. But when they stay at his guest house, they are paying for the stay. They are also paying for food from local eateries. Um, so this idea of finding a way to help the visitor enjoy themselves yeah. more mm. and leaving money in the local area. So it's a win-win. Yeah, right? I totally agree with that. Especially, you know, the transformation after and before and during the COVID, before uh, especially international tourists want to travel like a local, right? They want to find the most authentic place where the local people enjoy. Like in Mitsala, that Mihala Shishokudo is very Showa style uh, kind of food. Uh, but at the same time, after the COVID pandemic, people, uh, we don't have international tourists anymore. So local people want to travel like a foreigner because they, they travel the place they are really familiar with and a different perspective. So this is actually a good timing for the local business to do a more diversified approach to, to think in the new creative strategy to allow people to stay longer. But I also observe some problem during this process because you, you see when we talk about rural revitalization in Japan, uh, a lot of book on my table just shows this is the pizza process or the cafe We have so many cafe and pizza in same place. Uh, it's like 
pizza and cafe is a kind of a symbol of revitalization, but it's not shouldn't be like that. So it should be a more diversified approach. We also heard people mention on the island. Uh, they say we have four cafe. Uh, people want to open a cafe. Even more people want to mo open more cafe on our community. So what are we gonna do if everybody want to open a cafe? We we probably need something else, not just cafe, right? So uh, yeah, I think their feedback really is really important. We don't need ten cafe in one island. We need a more diversified approach. So art artists and and even the writers, the creative class on the island, they are quite diversified. For example, like like Tom, he opened a tea house. It's definitely good case to to solve the issue when you are not open a cafe. What you can do, right? Also, the scone business. It's, mm. it's kind of like a cafe, though. It's mm. a tea and scone cafe. But yeah. um, we need lots of cafes because mm. that's uh, if people want to come mm. and open a cafe and live there mm. or you know at least be there working on the weekends mm -hmm. you need in small rural areas like this you do need more options for people who are doing yes. day trips mm. you also need places for people to stay mm. yeah um but you need to also listen to what kinds of things the local people want exactly. right yeah. um like i visited tom's tea cozy mm. And he had a special secret pizza mm -hmm. just for local yeah, people exactly. who requested that. Mm -hmm. uh, when I visited Oheso Cafe in Sera in Hiroshima's countryside, that's how he started making pizza because the local people were asking him, mm. can you make pizza? We really want to eat pizza, you know? Right. So when you see the pizzafication of the rural areas, it often comes from what the local people are asking for too, yeah, right? Yeah. That's not just the outsider mm. it's really interesting yeah so uh, this could can be this actually not relate to what kind of restaurant or cafe they open i think this is an indicator those business uh consider the the, the quality of life of local residents or not so like we said before uh if there are a, a lot of business actually also in some other island they only uh engage with the tourists so local people will con perceive those business not really, uh, re really warm to them. Of course, we can really think about that. Uh, why you come to my community to do this? But we see good example. But but the cafeization case is not just uh, related to the local request. I think it's also connect to a factor. The local newcomers with the business they also perceive some kind of competition. So that's also relate to uh, the sustainable management. I think if you want them to live, work happily, there there will be some uh, micro uh, level, community level management here. Yeah, mm. and that's when that's when good regulation really makes a big difference, yes. right? Like if you say, "Oh, you want to start a business? Great, mm. tell us about it." Oh, we require that you do this this and this mm. that you don't do this this and this and have like a dialogue yeah instead of just saying yes or no completely um mm. all people who want to go live there or buy houses or start new businesses right. kind of need to spend time there oh, yeah. and get to know locals and mm. make sure that it's it's going to be a good relationship right? yeah so the local control of this process is uh, ex uh, very important but i also found out the other side of extreme local control like the case in kamiyama there is a the lady want to open a cafe but she is really has a really good skill for making cafe i i, I see the quality of how she roasts the beans but because the community is not really uh, accept that so in the end she end up with a coffee roasting place so it's a you can see if it's a too much local intervention you can't really do a lot of the thing you want to do so in my perspective it's a it's about the balance and constant conversation by time mm. absolutely everything in balance for sure mm. um and this is the same discussion that we were having about the minka mm. at the minka summit right mm. Um, now, old houses, Minka, are so cheap and you can find really good ones. Right. Um, you can remodel and move in. But the problem is if 
too many businesses get the idea to do this quickly and not not very well mm. it it would go the wrong way you know so now as an organic slow moving process mm -hmm. it's really good and i think you often talk about that in your research as well mm. how that organic slow moving yeah. approach is is really important mm. but you also talk about the huge drop in population oh, yeah. <laughs> and the big mm. problems with the changing demographic, right? right. This is the Utah so much is population. So mm. do you have time to yeah. take the slow approach? That is the question, right? Yeah. So that's basically uh, back to 2014, Sasaki wrote a book and she talked about the creative depopulation issue, right? But uh, I think it's important to think about that, but that's not the only way we should think about it we should do as much as we can do this is actually what tom told me do what we can do and do our best but we don't know the future we just do our best actually uh last friday one student when i gave her a lecture in taiwan university she somehow asked me how much is is more sustainable if we really provide more resources and uh, create more CO2 just uh, helping what we call revitalization. Is that really sustainable approach? Why don't they move to the city? Suddenly, in a moment, I can't really answer that question. Yeah, it's really about how much is enough. So <clears throat> they should have. A, well, I, hmm. yeah, that is that's a really good question, hmm. Mo. I would, I often say when you talk to people who live in the rural areas, hmm. their carbon footprint is so much lighter. Yeah than a lot of people who live in the city. Yes. Uh, when you talk to Akira Sakano mm -hmm. from Kamikatsu, who's now in Kyoto, mm -hmm. she talks about her life in rural Japan. Everything she used, everything she bought mm -hmm. came from that local area. Yeah. You can't do that when you're yeah. in the city. You can't grow your own food. Oh, yeah. You can't you know, use the local water, no convenience stores. <laughs> So if you look at the lifestyle impact, mm. then it is a lot more sustainable. If more people want to do it, mm. it keeps these communities alive, keeps the heritage and history alive, mm -hmm. but also it keeps a more sustainable, slower life, mm. maybe more meaningful life, yes. which emotionally mm. and mentally is also really important, right? Yeah, I think I grabbed two points. I want to follow up this conversation. One, you talk about more people involved, more people accumulating in some area. This is also what uh, what Simona and I keep focusing on is about the cluster. No matter she's focusing on the organic farmer cluster, I focus on the creative class cluster. This is important because you have a network. Like I said, uh, the network is very complex, but four parts. One part is the community side. One part is the, the local, extra local, uh, this resource exchange network. Some point you see those newcomers come to a place, they become, uh, suddenly they become a temporary network for the community revitalization. And one side is related to tourism. Some aspects are not related to tourism. But if you, uh, for this level, they all collaborate and co-create with the community together. Everybody want, also want to be look nicer from uh, and earn the trust from local, right? But at their private creative network with the city and where they come from, this network often quite private. They don't want to share this kind of resources. If it, in terms of tourism business, sometimes it's, it's a competition network. So, but this is a good thing. This is definitely excellent, excellent thing. We need, uh, they need to have a pressure to keep changing themselves, to be more creative than yesterday. So that's the one thing about uh, the cluster. I think that's a, definitely a healthy indicator to evaluate network. Another concept is uh, what we uh, keep researching, the new endogenous development for rural. Uh, but we somehow want to adapt this concept from new endogenous development into revitalization because it's still quite different and, and uh, could be evaluated by a uh, different perspective, which basically say both community and those relational and uh, newcomers have to uh, actively engage with each other to co-create their future. Uh, it's not 
there is no duty for newcomer must have a mission to revitalize. If the local people also have the similar interest, this process will likely to happen. Compared with the community, uh, they don't even care. Like, like Megijima people says, uh, we did what we do, but uh, we don't care. So we are aging then, so what? Yeah, that kind of uh, mentality. So new indulgence in this point is very important. Top down, plus bottom up, and plus constantly, constantly changing uh, during this process. So that's what I want, yeah. I want to add it. Yeah. And, and keep assessing, mm. right? Yes. You, you have a, a basic rules, uh, basic strategies, mm. you mm. see how it's working, you accept new ideas, you see how it's working, you reassess mm -hmm. again, and then you make new goals, yes. new ideas, right? That is the sustainability circle. Yeah. That's how you have to uh, operate in order to have uh, people, planet, profit in balanced mm -hmm. communities in the cities as well as in the rural, I think anywhere, right? Yeah. So also there is a new approach of how we see sustainability we need to emphasize. Uh, Sustainability development, sustainable development SDG is not just a colorful box. You just fit your topic into this. The early model is a social, cultural, uh, social, economical, and environment, right? But during the recent 10 years, the academic world is really against this idea. It's oversimplified. So the SDGs doesn't really bring this idea better because you look at the different model there is a really less emphasize the value of culture because culture sometimes is intangible. It's hard to evaluate by numbers like economy or environment, like a CO2 emission, but culture in rural places, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a treasure box. You need to see where we put culture in this process. There is no culture in the SDG chart. If you're really looking at it, everything can be a culture. So culture, also, the old model, they put social culture into one is actually quite weakened the role of culture. In terms of creative tourism and cultural tourism development, how to reevaluate the local culture and transform this culture for future uh, revitalization and tourism development is, is very important because that's the value, how, uh, why people need to go there. So therefore, uh, now, uh, especially in the Northern European research like Sony, they try to put culture as the first pillar, which not uh, paralyzed with the other three, like economy, social, and environment, but they put culture in the first dimension on top of everything. Like we defined economy through our culture. We create the concept of nature through our culture. We even the society itself is a, is a body of culture. So in terms of cultural tourism, if you, do not think in this way. Uh, we we really ruined what we should respect more about regional culture. Yeah, culture. But mm. I I would not I would never mm. equate high quality of life for people mm -hmm. as lacking of culture. Of course, you need culture as an important part mm. of the quality of life for people. Mm. So when I say people, planet, profit, you absolutely have to have art. Right and culture and traditions and heritage you need all of that mm -hmm. nobody wants to live in a world without it yeah. right um but it's definitely an important aspect but like we say for everything right mm. everything in balance yeah now one of one of the really nice uh stories you had in your film was about a teacher mm -hmm. of uh wait i forgot shamisen yes. right he's also named tanagasam and yeah this is also in Mitarai, mm. um, and this is another example of how the heritage of the area, mm. the culture of the area is really difficult oh, yeah. to maintain as the population gets older yeah. and there's few chances to pass those traditions on to the younger generation. Yeah. Um, so that also became more difficult during the pandemic. Exactly. Right? So the local Shamisan group used to perform and practice, but because of COVID, they, they locked themselves in the door for two years. So this is uh, very lucky. We, we found a group leader and he really demonstrated how to do Shamisen, why Mitala has this special uh, music called Misa, Mitala Bushi. 
is not just uh, shamisen, but also the most important thing is about the lyrics and singing. So this is the culture only exists in this harbor. That's quite fascinating, isn't it? So uh, in, uh, in our uh, tourism study seminar in Hiroshima University, we have a new uh, PhD student from Singapore. His topic is using music to revitalize island community. So I really wish more people focus on that. Yeah, especially when we talk about the culture and sustainability, the art is actually play an important role to re-evaluate and re-inspiring the, the new and old art on those islands. And music okay. and art often goes together with storytelling. Yes. Um, how, how stories and history and heritage is passed down is often through art and music. How wonderful. Yeah. Uh, do you want to mention you are doing a seminar series for university in Taiwan yes. every Friday? Yeah, this Friday will be the third class. Talk about island uh, immigrants, micro entrepreneurship, and also the diversified network I just shared a little bit. Yeah, we have in this online teaching with uh, NTU because this supposed this supposed to be an on-site trip class. The student from Taiwan should visit the side of Inland Sea to facilitate more cultural exchange, but because of COVID now, we can't really do that. So therefore, it's become an online lecture. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Well, at least we have the capability to do it online, right? Yes. Like I've I've also been doing online walking tours, mm. you know, wow. just, just to keep practicing mm. um, talking about tourism and telling stories, you know, yeah. because we can. I have to learn uh, that from I you. also want to mention your wife, yeah. Simona Zolette, mm. is talking with us tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And you, you two often do projects and research together. Yeah. Uh, your documentary series, for example, mm -hmm. um, but she's more focused on the agriculture, regenerative agriculture, rural agriculture. Really excited to talk to her tomorrow. Uh, Mo, we have just three more minutes. Okay. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you would like to yes. mention? I will have a highlight of this conversation. So my understanding of revitalization uh, is not about, it's like a fire stove. Well, what we really need to continue is the fire, not the, the ashes, because a lot of people probably uh, really pay more attention on the, how many ashes they burn. But actually, our mission is continue the fire without dying. Yeah. No. I like that. Hmm. That's great. Yeah. Um, it's like the eternal flame yeah. that you can see also the in warmth. Peace Park, right? Yeah. Also the feeling <laughs> of the warmness. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, uh, keeping things going yes. is is such a big challenge, right? Uh, starting new projects, mm -hmm. that's easy. Yes. But keeping it going over a long time, mm. that's hard, yes. right? Um, so we have to find the secret ways to keep people motivated to keep going. Mm. And I think, Mo, this is how you are helping so much with all your wonderful research and your films um, to help support people who are trying to do interesting, innovative, and very uh, valuable things in these rural areas. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. Yeah, thank you very much, Joy, to having me and sharing my story. Of those. Oh, wonderful. Um, there is one more that we didn't mention yet about the island communities, mm -hmm. the small island cultures. Oh, yeah research initiative yeah. do you want to introduce that uh we call it secret secret actually uh, already exists quite long ago uh almost 20 years uh by chance i i go to jamaica having their conference uh i know this is a small community but the impact of the island study is just the beginning because island study is quite interesting in terms of they allow people from different disciplinary to work together like not just humanity and social science, often we meet people research uh, like a disaster and climate change, like a nature science as well. So how, this is the society allow you to put a lot of different disciplinary into one. And especially when we talk about island and islandness, the, the perception of the island normally is isolated and water covered by, uh, uh, a rock covered by water, right? 
But so for secret, we try to do is the next uh, level of thing by promoting, uh, make our research into a more uh, auditory and auditory approach. Yeah, that's about secret. And we, we uh, plan yeah. a lot of social media based research. That's wonderful. But that collaboration uh, between your research on mm -hmm. small island communities in Japan mm -hmm. and connecting and finding similarities and differences right. with people around the world who are researching and trying to help small communities mm -hmm. on islands, that must be so interesting. And there must be parallels. Yes in a lot of the the takeaways right yeah so for next year we plan to having our island study conference in hiroshima so Yay. yeah next year is going to be a big year because i think the g7 is also going to be in hiroshima next year Wonderful. so everybody out there come visit hiroshima it's the place to be yes. <laughs> let's make it happen <laughs> let's make it happen mm. Thank you so much, Mo, for joining today okay. and for sharing your insights. It was a really wonderful conversation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, and see you next time. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for joining. See you next time. See you tomorrow morning when we talk to mm -hmm. Mo's wife, Simona Zola.